Good afternoon. Glad you're here. Um, it's notary training, so if you're not here for notary training, then you may be in the wrong place. So I suspect all of you are here for that. I'm Richard Alexander. I'm the clerk of Superior Court. Uh, notaries are all, or certificates are all issued through my office. But we've noticed uh, there was probably a demand for knowing more about what notaries do. So we have today with us uh, uh, Mike Smith, who's communications director with the clerk's authority, and Rachel Rice, who is a project manager, and she was in charge of training, and that just means she does everything that she has to do. Uh, she's the go-to person, probably. A um, couple of housekeeping matters. No food or drink, please, inside the auditorium. Out in the hall, it's fine, but in here, uh, that's kind of the county rule. Uh, does everybody have one of these in some form or fashion? If you do, can you put it on silent, please, so we don't have too many interruptions? I appreciate that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the, our speakers and uh, hope you enjoy the program. Thank you, Richard. Uh, everybody hear me okay? Good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I'm not sure uh, how many people are uh, familiar with what happens in the clerk's superior court's office, uh, you know, unless you're an attorney or uh, a title searcher or something like that. But uh, um, besides offering things like this, uh, it's where all your public records are filed, real estate documents, divorce decrees. And on top of that, they also are part of the court system. Um, there's always someone from the clerk's office in any active court matter. So you're probably like I, I was many years ago before I started doing what I'm doing. And, you know, I go to the polls every four years and you see the names, clerk of court. And I'm like, I don't know. It's a clerk. What do they do? You know, they push papers. But it's a lot more than, a lot more than that. And I really appreciate Richard, uh, Richard having us. So we, we uh, started doing these classes uh, about a year and a half ago throughout the state. Um, kind of on a lark uh, with some co a conversation with some clerks of Superior Court and uh, because we've never done anything like this uh, for the public. We do a lot of training, but it's usually for their offices uh, specifically. And the response has been, and great, uh, it's been great uh, as evidenced by the number of people here today because you're here voluntarily, as you know. You're not required to take a course or an exam to be a notary, unfortunately. Um, the legislature may be doing something about that uh, next uh, winter. Uh, we'll see. Um, and, and so it's one of the rare occasions that you come to the courthouse and hopefully a pleasant experience because, you know, typically you get a jury summons in the mail and the first thing is you try to figure out how to get out of it. Well, I can tell you, you will not get out of it anymore. You can get deferred. You know, in the old days, if you knew somebody, knew somebody you just make a phone call and, you know, you can't do or you're involved in some court matter, uh, which is maybe or may, may not be uh, pleasant. And uh, so hopefully this is, this is a positive thing, and, and y'all learn something today. And I and, uh, said before, Rachel and I always end up uh, learning something from, from y'all. So really, uh, really appreciate um, y'all being here. So uh, those of, oh, how many people are notaries already? Okay. And how many are not? Wow, that's a good number. That's a good number. And how many people just thought they would kill an afternoon, an hour, 90 minutes? And, and I can't imagine what you were thinking this would be. I could think of something else to do to kill for 90 minutes, but hey, you never know. Uh, okay, so, um, and we'll talk, those of you that are not noticed, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the application process uh, toward the end. I'm going to ask that, uh, that you hold your questions toward the end so that we can get through uh, the material, um, short of you know something that's a, a national security matter. And of course, we would take a hand for that. But besides that, uh, let's hold those uh, uh, towards the end. Um, so can anyone tell me, oh, by the way, Rachel has a, a wireless mic. And so I'd ask if you have a question, uh, unless you want to stand up and you've got a booming voice, uh, that she run over and hand you the mic and, and so everybody can hear it. Uh, what do you think a notary's primary responsibility is? Everybody eat lunch? <laughs> Don't get sleepy on me. Yeah, what do you think a notary... Not, okay, so someone comes before you, the signer comes before you, they hopefully uh, prove to you they, who they, 
they are who they say they are. They signed the document in front of you. You execute all that. So if you do that, what do you think you've done? Sir? You've see right? That's part of it. You've verified. You, you, they, you know, you're, you're comfortable that, that they, are, so they, ha- they are who they say they are through they presented ID or, of course, if you personally know them. If you do all that, it's one word I'm looking for, or really two words, but... Uh, sorry? Mm, no. Uh-oh, what happened there? Uh-oh, that's not good. Now, why is that going dark? Uh, you have prevented fraud. That's what you've done. Um... You know, fraud is uh, something that, um, you know, that's why there are laws written to deter things like fraud. And so if you've done your responsibility as a notary, uh, you have prevented fraud. That, uh, now, if someone is determined to prevent fraud, I mean, if someone is determined to commit fraud, they're probably going to do it. Right? Doesn't mean that there shouldn't be some roadblocks in that way. In that, uh, you can sit there. It's okay. It, it says reserve, but nobody's sat there this morning. So you can just, there you go. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, so you've prevented fraud so that, uh, yeah, when, when, when that signer walks away from you, you are assured that they are who they say they are. Okay? That looks weird. What do you think? I don't know what happened. Uh, okay. Now, all of it's not displaying. No, it's not a matter of that. It's a matter of... Yeah. Okay. While they're working on that. One thing that is strongly recommended, and when I say that because what we talk a lot about today are best practices, that notary, the, the Georgia statute, Georgia law does not speak specifically to a lot of things that a notary should do. And that's not uncommon, unfortunately, across state lines. A notary law sometimes does not get the attention that it should. And so a lot of what we'll talk about today um, will be best practices. Thank you, sir. Uh, it pays to have the uh, AV, IT genius in the room. All right, so um, how many people keep a journal, a record of the notarial acts? We got a smattering. It, it, again, I'm not, and I don't want to hear back from somebody that says, Mike Smith said you must. I'm suggesting that you do because what you do when you keep a journal, you capture the important elements of that, the type of document, the signer's name, some, some, some of their uh, information, their address, uh, the type of, they're gonna, obviously you're going to record the type of ID they presented the date and time, so on and so forth. It is something that protects you as the notary. Uh, This is a sample page from uh, my journal. Now, I don't notarize that much. I have a a commission because sometimes I'm asked to do things in my office to help out where maybe another notary has made a mistake. So um, if you can see up there, the date notarized is October 26, 1999. If I ever were asked about that, whether it be in a formal manner or just someone inquiring, there is no way that I remember Mr. Joel Shell from October 26 of 1999. It was some type of adoption papers, a date and time. He gave uh, some information, uh, his phone number, and, and, and things like that. Because... If someone, and you keep, if you keep good records, and if someone were ever to ask you about a document, and like I said, whether it's in a legal manner or not, you can refer to your journal and say, yeah, I did that almost 16 years ago because there it is. Conversely, if you keep good records and you're asked about a notarization on a document and you don't have a record of it, then that should raise a red flag. Maybe your seal wasn't your possession, somebody else used it. Otherwise, you would have an entry in your journal. Again, I'm not here to sell journals, 
I'm just saying that it, it's a good practice to, to keep those. Um, there is uh, some legislation that was introduced last year that didn't, never got voted on, but uh, that we are told will come up again in January during the 2016 uh, legislative session in Georgia's House Bill 381. And in that, the draft form, if it were to pass in its current format, and, and who knows, because a lot of times bills get introduced and they get turned and churned and they come out differently on the far end, it would require a notary to keep a journal. Um, but we'll keep an eye on that. If that were to come to pass, uh, we would certainly advertise that fact, and as would uh, Mr. Alexander's uh, office, and uh, they, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there would be an effective date far out enough where people could uh, have a chance to get uh, uh, familiar with it. So anyway, that's my spiel about keeping a journal. Um, you can find them at office supply places. There are notary, there's online notary associations that will sell um, supplies. Uh, you can make your own. You can just line off your own, doesn't matter. Uh, but I just think it's, we just think it's a good practice. There it goes again. I'm getting the same. <sighs> there it goes. All right, okay, so this next thing is a little uh, true false, fill in the blank type uh, exercise that um, uh, we'll take a look at. Just kind of see how much you may or may not know. It's okay, uh, however, you, we're not scoring these at home. Um, we're not even scoring them here. So, all right, so how much do you know? A notary public is commissioned by the County Board of Commissioners Chairman. Right, who? What did, what did Richard tell you? All right, those of you that are notaries certainly, hopefully, know where you got commissioned because you had to go there. Right, Clerk of Superior Court of the county in which you reside, not where you work, not where you vacation, where, not where you were born, unless it's the same place as you reside, um, that's where you go. And we get this question uh, more than you might think, uh, especially where we live. Now, those of you that have, have not had the pleasure or advantage of, of traveling a lot outside in, into the state of Georgia, outside metro Atlanta, into, uh, honestly, most of Georgia is small and medium size. Um, and so when I tell this, when we're teaching this in those small counties, it doesn't, doesn't really relate because they don't have the issues that we have here like this. If you live in Cobb and you work in Fulton, you cannot easily travel east and west in this city. You cannot do that. It just doesn't happen. And so the comment will be, I know, uh, and I know I live in Cobb, but I work in Fulton. I spend most of my time in Fulton. Why can't I just get commissioned there? Because the law says you get commissioned in the county in which you reside. And I really don't think it's that big a imposition that once every four years you go to the courthouse in the county where you reside to get your, uh, your notary commission. So that's where you go, okay? Oh, shoot. Okay. And we said Paul, we got the right. Okay. A person who is not a citizen of the U.S. Uh, may be a notary public in Georgia, and I'll tell you already, you're going to miss it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, it, you, can't, you can be a legal resident according to Georgia law. Um, and so uh, that is fairly common across the country, um, being a legal resident and, and a U.S. citizen. Uh, the, I had a person wanted to argue and get into a whole immigration thing. I'm like, look, I'm not, oh, no, 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 no. We don't have enough time or alcohol in this room to, uh, to go in the whole immigration thing. Go talk to Donald Trump because apparently he has all the answers. Um, and that was not a political commentary there. Uh, I haven't decided who I'm voting for. But anyway, uh, yeah, so, uh, but it goes back to a Supreme Court case uh, a few decades ago where the Supreme Court basically said that, uh, um, a legal resident can act in the same capacity as a U.S. citizen and you know, that kind of thing. So that's all that is. Okay. A Georgia notary public may perform official acts anywhere in the United States. Yeah, no. Don't do that. All right. Um, every state is allowed to pass their own laws. They're all, every state's sovereign, you know. That's what makes, you know, this country unique. Um, and why so many countries would love to be like us, and they just can't seem to figure it out. Um, that, 
Each state can pass their own laws. So um, Georgia says, nope, you can only do it within the physical boundaries of the state of Georgia. So that when you're commissioned as a Gwinnett notary, as long as you have your seal with you, you can notarize in any of the 159 counties, right? And you all knew we had 159, right? Okay. Now, now you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So wherever you physically are, as long as you're in the physical boundaries of the, of, of the state of Georgia, um, you can notarize. A notary's primary function is to explain legal documents and witness signatures. Unless you're an attorney. Now, uh, there are many attorney notaries out there. I don't know if you've got any attorneys in here. Um, I doubt it because you can't bill for these hours. But, um, <laughs> or maybe you can. I don't know. Um, that... Uh, and I have some, I, I, I've done the same joke with friends of mine who are attorneys, so yeah, they try to bill me when we're out at, you know, Taco Mac or whatever. But, um, so no, right, uh, do not explain in legal manner. Of course, that's, that's a big no-no. You're, you're practicing law when you do that. And, you know, Rachel and I, in both of our capacities, not just with notary law, uh, or notary, but other, other things, rest, it's hard sometimes because I think most of us try to, uh, especially if we know, you want to help people, okay? Um, and I've had to pull back sometimes and not go over that line. I know the answer. You know, there are certain documents that are filed in the clerk's offices where it's required that a, a certain piece of equipment or collateral be described, okay? And I know how to do it because I've seen a million of these things, but I can't tell that person how to do it. And if you'll see in his office, for instance, I'm sure he's got signage up that says... Basically, his staff is not allowed to give legal advice for obvious reasons, or otherwise, you know, there'll be a lawsuit probably the next day. So, anyway, don't explain legal documents. Now, you, if someone asks you to read it to them, you might say, why? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but that's fine. Just don't explain it. All right. Uh, okay, basically, when the, oh, here we go. When the document signer is not present, the notary is permitted uh, to notarize the signer's signature if the notary verifies the signature via electronic communications, uh, text, phone. Uh, yeah, that is, that's false. Currently it's false. You know, who knows? Uh, one day of the future with, with techno technological advances, uh, maybe there'll be a way to, to do that. Um, the state of Virginia actually passed a law that allows for a video type process I uh, don't know that anybody's actually used it yet. And it's not really that high tech. It's, uh, you're basically using uh, technology like Skype, and then you're, the signer's holding up their ID to the, to the camera. And, and, and most in the notary industry frown upon that because you still can't do certain things uh, remotely, uh, accurately. For instance, you, know, you can't determine necessarily uh, someone's demeanor or whether they completely understand why they're there, which is something that you should do. Okay. A notary may not certify a photocopy of a birth certificate or a deed. Anybody know what those type of documents are considered? Birth certificate or a deed are considered... Well, public records, publicly recorded documents, okay? So that, for instance... Um, in, in, in Richard's office, um, public records of the county are, reside in his office so that they're open for public inspection, unless it's something sealed by a judge, like, you know, juvenile court records typically and things like that. But, you know, uh, real estate deeds, you know, he's got on computer, he, they got books, they got whatever. Well, you may not have, they quit making books a long time ago, but you can see the historical books. Uh, you can go in his office and spend all day looking at real estate records if you choose. Uh, they get a lot of folks coming in doing genealogy research, stuff like that. So public records are, and certified copies are available from the source. So a notary would, would not be allowed to certify to those. So if someone asks you to do that, you just refer them back to that. Now, unfortunately, I can't give you a nice neat list of what's a public record and what's not. There's not one that exists that I know of. I always try to think of it in the terms of, is this open for public inspection? You know, it, and 
we talk about a lot about public records because that's kind of in our wheelhouse, but also realize that the great majority of documents that are notarized in a day's time in Gwinnett County are not public records. They're in your office, they're business to business stuff that never see the light of a public inspection. So, uh, uh, you know, for instance, if you were ever asked to do that, then just know that a notary is not allowed to do that. Now, his office would be happy to issue a certified copy of a deed, but it would be issued under the seal of his office, not someone that's a notary um, in his office. A social security card and a library card are not acceptable forms of identification. And why is that? R yes. Although a couple of weeks ago, I was admonished by a woman in a small county who says, oh, our, our library card has a picture. I'm going, good. Typically, okay, I should say typically, my experience is, and I don't have a library card. I, I don't. My, I, I just, you know, I just don't. So uh, I don't know. I'm assuming Gwinnett, if you, Gwinnett County's library system doesn't have a picture. Maybe I need to change the question um, just for that one person, but yeah. And again, this is not... In the, this is not in the law. This is, this is recommended best practice. And, and as far as ID is concerned, the law talks, it uses the term satisfactory. And what that's saying is it's satisfactory to you, not satisfactory to the, to the signer, not satisfactory to Richard Alexander, not satisfactory to me. It's satisfactory to you. And if it's not satisfactory, you can ask for something else. And if they can't produce it, you can re respectfully decline and uh, they'll move down the line, and unfortunately, they'll eventually get somebody to do it, but you won't be on the hook, so. Okay, when performing an act, the notary should indicate in the tariff certificate, the state and county, the notary's residence. Before we get into this, I will tell you this. We got to number eight this morning, <laughs> and I don't know what happened. Uh, we got, we, we were, I mean, it was good. I mean, it was good. There was like, a, that started like a million questions, and I guess we are on this for about, I don't know. 20 minutes or a long time? About wore me out, I'm just saying. So, okay, so the certificate is either, it can be a physical certificate, but it's that language you see, you, you know, usually get those that are pre-printed, you know, it says state of blank, county of blank, appeared before me, that's called the certificate. And um, so when you see that and you execute that, the notarization, what do you think? And you've, you know, you've signed as a notary, you've imprinted your seal. What do you think goes in that blank? I'm sorry? Perfect, right off the bat. I don't have anything to give you. I would if I had a, but usually people say Gwinnett County or whatever county we're doing the class that day. Uh, no, it's where you physically are when you perform that notarial act. Because think about it, you already have Gwinnett County on your seal. And I apologize, I keep saying, some of you may not be from Gwinnett, and that's fine. This, is, this was not restricted to only Gwinnett County uh, residents. But uh, yeah, where you physically are. So in any of those 159 counties, and, and you know, a good example is, is myself. So I'm a Fulton County notary. Our office is in the cab. So I don't notarize a lot, but, but when I do, it says, you know, County of the Cab. And if you have your seal with you, which I normally carry with me, which is kind of a geeky thing. Uh, but if you were asking me to do something today, I could, but it would have Fulton County Notary Mike Smith, and it, but it would have County Gwinnett, okay? And hopefully, you know what county you're in. When you, <laughs> when you, uh, you don't, hey, if you don't, don't be afraid to ask. But I'll be honest with you, and I say this to all my good friends in South Georgia, um, it's not always clear what county you're in. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you might be in, unless you're like right in town and right there's the courthouse in every small town. If you're ever lost, look for the clock tower. Um, right, okay. A notary may notarize his sister's signature uh, on a power of attorney, giving him the authority to care for a minor child. Don't answer yet, because I can tell you, you're probably going to get this. The, 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 you're going to use the correct word here for the answer but you're probably not going to say that you know, for the right reason, I'll just tell you. So go ahead and say it. Right, okay, why? Yeah, 
you're closer. It has, okay, it has nothing to do with brother or sister. Georgia law does not even speak to that. It's a best practice if you don't. And the reason for that is if there was ever a, a question of, about a document, and in, certainly if they got involved in a court case, I think any attorney worth their fee is going to establish the fact that this was notarized from brother to sister, and of course you did, because you're related. Um, it's because he is a party to the document. You were kind of there. You were saying conflict of interest, but because uh, in 4517.8c2, it does specifically say that a no person may not notarize if they're a party to the document, and that's the case here. Okay. Uh, Georgia law allows uh, notaries to charge any amount that's reasonable. I don't know what that would be. What's reasonable to me is certainly probably not reasonable to you. <laughs> right? No, it's, it's, uh, it's false. It's a whopping $2. Anybody charging more than that? Because we got deputies outside if you're, uh, <laughs> no. Hey, I, I don't have, a, like I said, I don't have a badge. I don't want a badge. I can't arrest anybody. Um, there is no uh, notary police, um, notary chief, whatever. Um, but yeah, you can do that. You can charge $2. Uh, again, I know most people are notaries because you went to work somewhere and someone said, we need a notary, right? And large businesses, they'll say, we need a notary on each floor or something like that. Um, and so it's, it's not even worth most of our time, most of our times to, uh, to, to charge. do not make you a bad person if you do but it's $2. Uh, I think I've only been charged once. We, I was at a, a, this uh, meeting, and it was a document that had to be signed by five of us. And, um, of course, I couldn't notarize because I'm part of the document. And so we asked the hotel, um, do you have someone on staff that can do this for us? They didn't, but next door was uh, City Hall. And uh, they called over there, a lady came over. I mean, she was very upfront. She said, be glad to do it. It'll be $10. We were happy to do it, though. I mean, because we were kind of stuck. Had no problem with it. Um, there are cases uh, that I use this example all the time. There's a lady from one of the classes in the last year who does work for a, uh, for a nursing home. And you might say, well, why didn't the nursing home have a notary on staff? I, I, I really don't know, except the fact this is a very small county. And so when they needed something, they called her. And so what she did was she would search, she'd charge them the two bucks, but then she had prearranged and pre-negotiated a travel fee. And that's fine. That's outside of that. And she simply wrote them a receipt reflecting that, you know, $2 times whatever, you know, the, no, the, how many, you know, the Terralax, and then whatever she had negotiated for the, for the travel fee. No problem with that. Um, I love to give this example. A, a gentleman who owns a uh, mailboxes, et cetera, franchise. He offers notarial services just as a convenience and to add value to his business so he maybe he can, get, he can attract more people in, maybe use his, you know, his uh, mailing service. And um, so he was in one of these classes and he raised his hand and he said, I charge seven fifty, so that's wrong. And I said, well, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, 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 he, I, and so I was curious. I said, you know, how'd you come up with a seven fifty? And this is classic. He said, well, $5 seemed too little and 10 seemed too much. And that was it. I mean, that was the whole, that was the whole thought process. And, and so, you know, we said, I think Rachel may have said too, I, I remember who told us, said, well, you know, that, you know, if you're going to do that, then, 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 you know, advertise it as, you know, $2 for the Notarial Act and $5.50 for a service fee, convenience fee, whatever. And then the customer can decide, is it worth my $5.50 to, to do that? Uh, seen it many times um, where uh, I said this morning um, I've been in way too many you know, Hampton Inns and Holiday Inn Expresses around the state of Georgia and um, you walk into the registration desk and uh, there's a little sign that says notary services you know ten dollars now depending on what kind of mood I'm in, <laughs> I'm in I may just let it go but I, sometimes I'll say well how did y'all come up with that and usually they don't know because it's you know the assistant to the assistant night manager that's there. And, and, and so, and then they'll say, well, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to get our man, you know, I'll tell our manager. I'm like, that's fine. You know, so, uh, you know, it, I have actually had uh, engaged in a conversation about uh, notary law 
We're standing in, in, in front of a registration desk, which is very odd, uh, and trying to cite them code section, which OC what? OCG what? Yeah, so it's not really worth my time. Um, no, it is. Okay, a notary may notarize the sign, uh, a notary may notarize the signature mark of a person when that person cannot make a normal signature. Is that true? Absolutely it's true. I mean, uh, the law was established a long time ago that if, if you indicate to me, you know, that is my mark, whatever it might be, and it could be several things. It could be, my first thought is, someone who's physically incapable of, you know, holding a pen, you know, uh, uh, they've, I don't know, maybe they're born that way, maybe had a stroke, maybe, I don't know, any of those situations. Um, and so they have, they have uh, evolved into, they have a mark they make, okay? And um, that's fine. So again, if you kept a journal, you're going to have a sample because they're going to mark also your book. And then you can make, and there's also a comment section in, in, the, in the journal. You know, you, I mean, the obvious is there's an X or whatever it is, but you're going to make a comment that the person indicated by Mark, you know, this is their, that's their signature. And um, I love telling this, <laughs> tell again, ladies and gentlemen, is I did this class for uh, a clerk's office in, in uh, South Metro Atlanta uh, two or three months ago. And the clerk's superior court there is a former, uh, she, by the way, she is a former city of Atlanta police officer. And she was uh, on patrol. That's what she did a lot. And if you met this woman, you knew, you know she'd handle herself. So she pulled over a gentleman one night. I don't know what this, I don't know what the, you know, she wrote the citation for. And she, you know, fills it out, hands it to him in his car, hands it back. Well, she looks at the signature line, and there's an X, right? There's an X. And diagonally, just below that, there's a smaller X, okay? And she said, sir, I, gotta, I'm just gonna, I need to ask you, I, uh, I'm a, a, you're, you're indicated by Mark that that X is your signature. And he said, yes, ma'am. And she goes, I got to ask, so what is the little X? And he said, I'm a junior. My dad couldn't write either. <laughs> so now I don't know if that's true. Uh, and I'm not, I, 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 I don't be offended if, if that's the way you have to sign things. I'm not saying that, but I thought that was, uh, that's kind of a neat little story that, uh, that she shared with us in that class. Um, but anyway, yeah, a mark considered, you know, their legal signature. So, and we're having a discussion at lunch, too, as we, you know, move along with more advances in technology and, and in the electronic document world, uh, you know, what we have always been taught as a signature is not, is just one aspect. I mean, uh, you know, you go online and you buy something or you sign up for something, and there's a, there's a, uh, a, uh, a section at the bottom that says, you know, you're authorizing da-da-da by checking that box. That's your signature. That is your signature. And, and, and it's, it's tough for some folks to get away from or think about that in other aspects. And the reason I bring it up is that bill I mentioned, House Bill 381, that if it does come around, it allows for electronic notarization and that's a, whole, that's, a whole, that's a whole class in itself when we ever get to that point. But, so it, it contemplates things like electronic signatures. Okay. Um, if the document signer is blind, the notary should read the document to the signer prior to notarization. Now, I've, I've never been faced with this. Uh, we've had a couple of folks in these classes that, that have. Um, so if someone comes to you and either through... You know, it's, it's obvious that they uh, are sight impaired or they tell you that. Um, should you read it to them? It, it's fine to read it, just don't explain it. Now, I think, for me, if, uh, if someone came to me and it was obvious that they were sight impaired and I asked them, would you like for me to read this to you? And they say, I understand. I've already had it read to me. Okay, I'm going to take their word for it. I'm going to make, <laughs> make them listen to me again and read it because 
You know, it's just, yeah, so, again, you may never be faced with that. And I know there are varying degrees of, of, of sight loss, you know. I mean, what's considered legally blind is not totally blind and all that stuff. So, um, and I think in my mind when we were doing these questions, I, I, I visioned uh, the, the sight-impaired person having another person there with them, but that's not necessarily the case, right? Because you could have a guide dog. You can certainly people that, I see people, there's a guy in my neighborhood, and he goes from the bus stop two streets away, and he's got the thing, right, the stick. And he's amazing, you know? Um, so I don't, anyway. Okay, the, uh, the law allows notaries to keep copies of documents they notarize in order to protect themselves in the event of a complaint, a complaint of misconduct is filed against them. Yeah, well, yeah, and you, and you don't want to do that. Um, another reason to keep a journal. If you keep a journal, you wouldn't even need to think about keeping a copy uh, for two reasons. If you're like me, you have enough of your own stuff to track down, right? And secondly, you could be opening yourself up to liability issues by retaining copies of documents of other people. Don't care if it's locked up, doesn't matter. Just don't do it. If you're doing it, just stop. Just, I'm not talking about, you know, in the course of your job where you're required to retain a copy for the company files. That's different. I'm talking about you personally as a notary. Okay. okay uh, number 14, a notary public may be held personally liable for any uh, financial loss caused by the notary's failure to properly perform his or, his, his or her official duties. What do you think? I, yeah, absolutely it's true. Does it matter that your employer paid for your commission or your seal or your hand, your whatever? That seal has your name on it, not your employer's. Um, and I know what I'm pointing out in this true false really are kind of worst case scenario things. The majority of stuff that you're doing is, for lack of a better term, it's routine. I get it. You're, you're, you're notarizing in, in typically uh, in your office. Uh, it may be the same type of documents over and over. It may, even be, be, it may even be for the same people over and over. But just don't get lazy with it. Just don't let something slip through, okay? And don't let yourself be put in an odd position. Uh, I say let yourself. That's not really true, not fair. But um, because uh, Rachel and I were doing this class about, I don't know, two years ago at least, um, we've been asked to come downtown. It was a large law firm. I mean, when I, it was, yeah, it was a large law firm. Because there probably were 40, 50 paralegals in that room, only paralegals. And so we did the class, um, and a gentleman comes up, actually I was speaking to Rachel first, or while we were standing there, and said he had been, he wanted to tell us about a situation he'd been put in, he didn't know what to do. Um, a partner in the firm, who obviously is his superior and can have a say-so about his career, um, came to him with a document um, that had been already signed by the attorney's wife, who obviously was not there, and it was common knowledge that this attorney was going through a nasty divorce. So this paralegal is like, I know what I'm supposed to do, but this person can, you know, do whatever. Fortunately, <laughs> this class was organized by their human resources person, and she happened to hear him start to tell the story. And so she, he repeated part of it to her, and she said, you come see me. And that's great. But a lot of us work for small businesses. You don't have an HR person to help you out. We don't even have a, a true HR person. We really don't. We got somebody that, that handles the insurance stuff and you know and handles payroll, but we don't have a true HR person. Which is it may sound funny in a, a state authority. We don't. Um, so all I can tell you is do the best you can. <laughs> um, and um, that was an extreme thing. Although I, I'm willing to bet that that happens more than you think where someone's put in a, in a tough spot. And I wish I knew how that turned out, but I don't know. Well, I do remember that while we, you don't really, yeah. the content of a document is not what you're certifying. This document was basically putting everything in his name. So had the notary proceeded to notarize yeah. it, yeah. 
that who knows what the financial ramifications right. could have been on Which the Which comes notary. back to the, yeah, the divorce thing. Yeah. So it was, it was tough. I think with that HR, she was, yeah, she, she was, was good. crack that whip. Yeah, she wasn't going to let that happen. Yeah, absolutely. You'd want her in your corner. Absolutely. Okay, so how did we do? Then we did pretty good. Yeah, that one thing always messes that pe people up about the brother sister. You know, it's just fun for me to mess with you a little bit. But it's, no, it, it really is. And 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 um, uh, there are some states where that's spelled out uh, that you can't notarize for immediate family members. But Georgia law, like a lot of law, uh, state laws, you know, laws in other states uh, doesn't speak to that. It's just a bad practice if you're doing it. Um, and I've made my family angry at me because I didn't do it. And my brother's like, really? You're going to? I said, I teach the classes. How can I, you know, <laughs> how can I do that? Yeah. All right. So you probably know what that is. You know, it's not a, uh, a reading off, a, off an EKG machine. It is a sample of a signature from a commission certificate uh, sent to us by a clerk's office. Now, when you're commissioned, um, copies of those documents are sent to us. We're a repository uh, for the clerk's offices. So we retain those. Those commission certificates, sometimes they also include uh, the application. And so one of the services that we do in our office is we issue what's called an apostille, which is a French word. And uh, it is simply a notification a notification, a certification of a notary that is uh, going to be uh, on a document that's going to a foreign country that belongs to this particular treaty that the United States is part of. It's an effort to streamline the commerce process. So uh, people come in, uh, typically it's like an adoption or to go work in a work overseas or something like that. Adoptions are the example I give because people will come in with stacks of documents like this. All kinds of things that they're required that they're going to take to some court in you know, Russia, for instance, and that court will you know, accept or reject, and then that'll go a long way towards them. Well, by the time they pay off all the court personnel, uh, they, they, will adopt, they will have their uh, adopted child. So um, now, the, the reason they have to have the apostille is that court will not recognize Mike Smith, Fulton County Notary. They will recognize this nice, pretty document that our office attaches. It's got our seal, and we attach it with a gold grommet, and da-da-da, and bugles are playing, and whatever. And, and that's what happens. So when we get a notarized document, we will compare that signature to uh, the way the notary signed their commission certificate that was sent to us by Richard's office. Now, we're not handwriting experts, but to the point we're reasonably assured that the person that signed that commission certificate is a person that, that notarized that document before us. And if it's not the same, in our estimation, we will reject it. I'm just asking. I'm, I'm not telling you because uh, we ha I had a case about three weeks ago where a clerk called me and said she had someone in her office who was angry because Mike Smith had said that she must change her signature and make it legible. And unfortunately, she also worked for an attorney who was kind of trying to prove a point. And I said, I'll tell you, I have never said that. I've said, I've said, I'm asking nicely that when you sign your commission certificate and when you sign as a notary, take a couple of deep breaths and give it some thought. That's all I'm asking. Because I know when you're notarizing, especially in your office, you're busy doing something like this. Somebody stand in your doorway, which we all hate because they won't say anything. You turn around, they want something notarized. You stop that. The phone's ringing. Da, 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 da. Okay? So either s slow down and take that or obviously ask them to come back when you're not all crazy, which sometimes is hard to find time that you're not. But just give it some thought. I will say that if you choose to sign like that, then do it that way every time. The problem is when there's like a, a, a signature like that, a person's not always consistent with it. And, I, you know, look, 
you sign a credit card receipt. You know, I, you know on, on mine, you can see the M, you might see the S, and, you know, whatever. That's a different thing. Um, I'm just asking, but, you know, it would, it, a signature I know is a very personal thing. You know, we all like the way our curves work and whatever. You know, the, especially the names end in I. You know, do a little, uh, I don't know, something over the I or whatever it might be. Uh, but, but, but I ask that you not do that, um, you know, in the course of notarizing a document. Now, this is the exact opposite, right? I mean, this is like a work of art to me. You know, and I have, this, I have this image in my head of the day they signed the Declaration of Independence. There must have been a line behind him, and people are like, seriously, Hancock, can you speed it up? We haven't invented air conditioning yet. It's July. Uh, and I'm wearing a wool suit, by the way. And uh, so, yeah, that's that. And then, you know, then you have Abraham Lincoln, which was very elementary. Uh, we know that he didn't have, did not have a lot of formal education, obviously a very intelligent man. But he, now he signed a lot of his documents the first initial. I'm not suggesting, <clears throat> actually I think it's a bad practice, uh, to be commissioned with a first initial last name. Um, unless you're one of those people, and I know a person like this, their given name is a first initial. It's two initials, actually. I've seen the birth certificate. I didn't believe him, and, uh, which you know, amazes me, but it is. Uh, so whatever you are commissioned as, just be consistent and know that when you sign that commission certificate, then that's the way you want to sign, or you, you must sign for the next four years. And not even, I'm not even talking about style now. I'm talking about if it's first, first name, middle initial, last name, then that's the way you got to do it for four years. If it's you know, whatever you choose to do. And of course, they're going to ask for your ID. And most people will just be commissioned with whatever the ID says. But um, it doesn't have to be what's on your birth certificate. It doesn't have to be three full names at all. Okay? Okay, I think I spoke enough about signatures. Okay. Does anybody put their seal over their signature? And it's okay if you do. <clears throat> this does happen. And I don't know exactly why. My speculation is that it's somewhere along the line. It's one of those, that's the way I've always taught to do it. It somehow brings legitimacy and adds to the, the integrity of the signature and the seal and da-da-da. It does not. What it does, it makes it hard to read both of those. I think it goes back to when most people were using the embosser and they would emboss over their signature. Of course, the embosser has no ink, right? So, but, but don't do that. It doesn't add, it doesn't make it more official, it doesn't do anything. And, oops, the best way is to do it this way, is, and there's no special place, right, left, bottom, whatever, in close proximity is all I can tell you to your signature. Um, I had a woman in the last class say that she was taught that she should imprint her seal just barely where it's touching her signature. Uh, that, that was an odd one. I, and, and, and she didn't even know why. It was because she was taught to do it that way. And I've tried to figure out why that would be. Uh, maybe that's a compromise. It's not on the signature, but it's touching it. I don't know. Um, you're all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, it wasn't crazy to her. That's the way she was taught. I don't know who taught it to her, but that's what it is. Um, so anyway, and you can see that, uh, that sometimes I realize that the documents before you, the signature page before you, uh, is, doesn't have a nice pretty area with the pre-printed certificate language. It, you may, just don't have anything. Maybe you've got basically white margin space, okay? In that case, don't try to jam it. Don't do it on the back. You can go to our website and you can print off these certificates and, and attach those. It gives you plenty of room. And um, then it's clear, everybody's happy, da 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 da. And I'll show you where to get those. Okay, those of you that are not notaries, uh, this is important. Um, but as you see, the qualifications are not taxing, as the people that are notaries will tell you. You gotta be 18, 
which a quick scan of the room tells me we pretty much have met that qualification. Um, I'm sorry? Right. OK. Uh, be a US citizen or legal resident. That was one of the things in the true false. Uh, you must be a legal resident of the county from uh, which you reside, right? There is, a, there is a provision, an exception for that. Uh, I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, you must have and provide an operating telephone number. It doesn't say what kind. It doesn't say it's got to be a cell, home, pay phone, which good luck finding one of those, or, or whatever. Uh, you must be able to read and write English language. Okay? And you might say, well, how does the clerk's office know if I can read and write English language? Good question, because they're not in the business of giving those tests. Uh, I do know some clerks, what they'll do is they'll ask the applicant to read the uh, oath back to them, which accomplishes two things. They did the oath, and it says you can read English, although I guess there's a way around that. If somebody could teach it to them, but I don't know, really. If you can go that far, I, that's, yeah. Um, now, there is an exception to the residency uh, thing. Uh, there's a provision, and it normally doesn't affect us in the central part of the state, but if a person lives in one of the bordering states and works or has a place of business in Georgia and can prove that to the, to the clerk's office in that county, they can apply to be a notary. And those states do the same thing for us. So in essence, a person could have two concurrent commissions in different states, just obviously wouldn't use the, you know, a good example is uh, uh, Augusta, Georgia, and North Augusta, South Carolina. There's just a river there, right? And people go across all the time and on that bridge. And uh, so a person living in South Carolina could certainly uh, work in Augusta, Georgia, and apply and get a commission. But like I said, you don't normally hear that here, but those bordering counties more of. And uh, so it's the uh, contiguous states. Who can name the uh, states? The, the contiguous states, yeah, the ones that touch us, right? Well, well hang on. You're starting at South Carolina, and which way are you going? Whoa, you went across the state. See, this messes my mind up, because I do like this in my head. So you went South Carolina, Alabama, Florida, Tennessee, and North Carolina. All right. You did almost like a square root thing, like a thing in a, and a thing. And that's fine. You got them. There's five, right? There's only five. There always will be five, unless they redraw the state lines. And, I don't know, but, um, okay. Very good. Again, I don't have any gifts, but uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so when you submit an application to the clerk's office, there are certain things that uh, Richard's office can consider before uh, they grant you that commission, okay? Um, and you may ask, as we see in the next section, uh, number one, why would someone's criminal history be important to be a notary. Well, if you think about what a notary does, <laughs> if you think about what a notary does, it being an impartial third party, uh, one thing that comes to light is um, that person's character, right? So if there's something on the criminal history, now, those of you who are notaries, you know that you were asked to declare convictions on your application, I don't know if you remember that or not, because then at the bottom you signed this statement that basically said, if any of this is a lie, I'm going to prison for 100 years or something like that. I, close, but yeah. So um, anyway, uh, and as part of this bill, uh, if it were to pass, there's a provision in there that would require a criminal history, a criminal background check, which right now it's, it's optional to the clerk's office. Typically, people are honest, is what clerks have told me. Um, we had a case, uh, we didn't have a case, we had a, something told us where there was a small town where a gentleman who is currently, you know, well-known um, biz, business guy in his mid-40s, family man, da, 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 da. And he applied for his notary, uh, applied for his uh, notary commission, and on the application, he declared a DUI conviction. The clerk checked, and the conviction was when he was 19 years old. She obviously said that has no bearing now. As a matter of fact, she goes, I applaud him for even listing that. Because she said, 
I don't think I'd have ever known. I'm not going back and looking at DUI convictions from 25, 26 years ago. So it's not always necessarily going to be a bad thing. And because if that's on there or something like that, you're going to have a chance to explain it because you go in and some, whoever's handling the, 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 the commissions for Richard that day is going to see that, right? And certainly they're going to ask uh, the circumstances about that. So um, it's better to do that than it is not to list it and then later it come up to see it. I know there's a Leave It to Beaver se uh, session. There's a Leave It to Beaver show in there somewhere. Um, and I probably dated myself there because a lot of you don't even know what Leave It to Beaver was. But um, mate, you saw the reruns, though. That's where I saw them. I didn't see the, I don't remember the original show. Good Lord. <laughs> um, okay. If you've had any other type of professional license revoked or suspended, you know, Georgia has, and I always mess this up, I think it's 38 or 39 licensing boards that, that pretty much all those fall under the Secretary of State's office. Anything from uh, selling insurance and securities to cosmetology, you have to have a license for. So a, real, a realtor is a good example. Um, if you've had that li a license like that revoked or suspended, again, that might be a red, that'd be a red flag for his office. They would ask you about it. Why was it suspended? You know, was it something to do where you, um, you know, would bring your, your, uh, your character into question, okay? Uh, if you have been found to practice the or, or committed the unauthorized practice of law in this state or any other state, obviously that's a big deal. Um, there's going to be something on the books um, about that. Um, now, if in fact your commission is revoked or denied, there is an appeal process where you may find it difficult is you're going to appeal it back to the same person that just revoked or suspended your commission. Now, you might catch Richard on a good day. He's a nice man, and he's willing to listen to reason, uh, or whoever he is put in charge of listening to those type of things. Um, and then if you don't like that, you can request a non-jury hearing before a judge, which I have never heard of happening in the state of Georgia. Typically, the things that, that we hear, we get complaints. Well, we don't have, uh, despite the fact that the word authority is in our name, we have no authority. Um, we, we get a complaint against a notary. We just refer them back to the clerk's office where they got commissioned. And so uh, in that case, you know, they'll handle it and, and, and do dispense of whatever. A lot of times, and I know the old adage of ignorance of the law is no excuse, but a lot of times with notaries, it is ignorance of the law because why? You're not required to take a course. You're not required to pass an exam. You're not required to read anything. By the fact that you're here of your own time, you're ahead of the game. You took some initiative to spend Friday afternoon, you know, in Langley Drive in Lawrenceville, Georgia, where you could probably be doing something else, and, and that's a good thing. So, um, yeah, so the, oops, hit the wrong, here we go. Okay. So let's look, at, uh, let's look at what you have the authority to do as a notary. Now, number one, uh, A1, I'm sorry, you don't think of it in these terms, but that's about 98% of what you do as a notary. It is. Especially the witness and, and other written instruments, attesting, witnessing. That's, you know, you can take acknowledgments, you can also give oaths, as long as that oath is not required to be given by an official or someone in official capacity where it's required to do so. I've had to do it one time. A gentleman came in, and it was, it actually, it was, it, 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 I remember reading the document, it was clear I was supposed to give an oath. And I just asked him to raise his right hand, and yeah, we did it. Most people think about oath, we think about, you know, in an open, you know, somebody's given an oath of office, right? You know, uh, 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 Richard, Mr. Alexander, is required as a constitutional officer of the state of Georgia, one of only four, um, to take an oath of office um, before he takes office again in, um, when he's reelected. But that uh, is required to be given by a probate judge. Uh, you know, you're, you might be Richard's best friend, but you wouldn't be allowed in law to give that to him in his official capacity. So 
Um, and that's why, you know, you see the president, right, every four years, and that's why you see, uh, you know, the big guy up there, black robe, two gold bands, right, Supreme Court Justice, that's required. It'd look kind of funny if the president had a buddy who was a notary in D.C. up there with a hoodie on, you know, giving his, uh, or his, you know, his, uh, or his suit. Um, but that's why we have the official, official thing. It's a ceremony. It is... Um, you might think, well, why is, it, why is it important to verbally have that exchange? Because in the, in, it, it, there is that ceremonial part to it, okay? Um, our board, we have, a, uh, we have a board of directors, and when we have a new person come on, they're required to take an oath of office for our board. And, and in that case, they're not required to take it from a specific person. So me as a notary in the office, always give that, that oath um, to those new board members. So... Um, okay, uh, this, uh, uh, 45, 17, 8, 6 talks about that true-false question we had about public records, that you can make certified copies as long as it's not a public record or a publicly recorded document. I've had this exchange with a woman over the last couple of days about, and, 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 and I know she wasn't really sure what she was asking, and I wasn't clear as to whether she was asking about a public record. But after all this, I found out these are historical documents, but they are in a church library. And I said, I don't know if that's considered a public record. At, you know, uh, at my, I guess I would say, is the public allowed to come into your church and just inspect them at any time during regular hours? That's what I actually, that's what I said back there. I haven't heard back. Um, so we'll see. But anyway, so, um, and then number seven, you'll see in a lot of uh, statutes, basically it says that uh, the legislature, if they forgot something, then they're covering themselves by saying you perform other such laws or perform other such acts as recall through us by form um, by other laws of the state. Okay. So what are you not obligated to do? So no one can just come in and demand that you, that you perform an notarization. Okay. They don't have a right to do that, um, as, we, as we'll talk about here. If, in fact, if it's for a transaction that you know or suspect is illegal, false, or deceptive, you don't do it. I would certainly hope if you know it's not. Because if you do that, I'm not an attorney. That sounds to me like a willful act. That's a whole different level. Uh, Mr. Alexander might be having a discussion with Mr. Porter in the DA's office. I don't know. But anyway, um, if, you, if it's for a person you feel, uh, you feel is being coerced, you know, and it's not going to be as obvious as the signer comes in with somebody standing beside him with a gun in their ribs, right? Um, which takes me to three. For a person whose demeanor causes compelling doubts, right, about whether the person knows the consequences of the transaction, um, again, it may not be as obvious as, you know, you think they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol. It could be someone who you believe doesn't have the mental capacity to understand why they're there. And the best thing I can tell you is this. It, it may not even be something that you can describe verbally. It may be nothing more than you have a gut feeling or a hunch that something's not right. And that's fine. You can legally and respectfully decline to do that. And I cannot tell you how many times in my life, I'm trying to get better about this, where my gut feeling was the exact correct answer. I was right the first time, and I, <laughs> and I rationalized myself out of it, and then later on said I was right the first time. So... Under this section of the law, all I can tell you is when you have someone come into your office, I would think just as, you know, being courteous, hey, how are you, uh, that kind of thing, have a seat, uh, you know, try to use that as, the, as trying to do, determine what you think, you know, whether they understand, you know, you can ask a direct question. Do you know why you're here today? Or why are we here today? Have you had a chance to review the document? Not that you're going to, you know, explain it to them. Um, those types of things might give you some insight 
as to their demeanor and whether you think they're being coerced. Again, 99.5% of the time, it's routine. It's somebody down the hall in your office, da 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 Even those people, though, sometimes, especially those people you can sometimes tell something's not right. I mean, I've known Rachel for 10 years, and, and, and we're, our, our offices are fairly close. And, uh, and other people in our office, I mean, you can usually tell something, they're not, something's going on, something's not right today. And you usually ask a question, you okay today? You know, that kind of thing. Anyway, enough of my psychology part of the, of the course. Um, okay, now, you are disqualified from notarizing under these circumstances. Okay. Now, someone this morning, bless your heart, as they say in the South, asked the question, and we get the phone call. May I notarize my own signature? <laughs> no. You know, kind of defeats the purpose. Just as the question I got many years ago, um, where did I find a blank seal? I don't know what was going on with that one. And if you find a seal maker doing that for you, let me know who that was. Uh, yeah, when, when uh, you, you can't notarize your own signature. Well, you can. It's illegal. And somebody asked me, well, that's obvious. That's common knowledge. Why would you even have that in the code section? And here's why. If, in fact, someone is in a court matter and they're a defendant, or, okay, and yeah, it's common knowledge you can't notarize your own signature. I can promise you this, if that is not in black and white, what's a good attorney going to say? I don't care what common knowledge says. It's not in the law, right? Um, okay, number two goes back to that true-false question we had about the brother or sister. It says, when the notary is a party to the document or transaction in which no terrible acts is required. One question I get is, is, is we've gotten is this, um, and I always use a bank. If it's, it could be any business. Um, I notarize documents for my business. Okay? Now, these documents may or may not be something that's going to help our business, you know, something involved in a, a business transaction that will lead to more business. So am I a party to the document? In that, que in that case, I say no. You're not a party to the doc. You're not named in the doc. I know what you're saying. You're indirectly going to benefit because by the fact you notarize this, then this documentation is something they need to close this piece of business which will bring revenue to your business. I get all that. I think really that's not the intent uh, of what the law is saying here. Obviously, if he or she is named as a principal in that business, then that's, that certainly falls under this, okay? Um, a notary public shall not execute a notarial certificate containing a statement known by the notary to be false, nor perform any action with intent to deceive or defraud. That should be obvious, but it's in there. Don't do it. Um, okay, E, I always like to emphasize because it says, in performing any notarial act, a notary public shall, and I'm no attorney, but I was told many years ago by our attorney, that when you see shall and must, there's no gray area, okay? Shall confirm the identity of the document signer, oath taker, affirmant, based on personal knowledge or satisfactory evidence. That is satisfactory to you as a notary, not anybody else. You have to be satisfied with it. And you'll, you know, you see on the, on the, the certificate language, it'll say you have two options. You check the line, personal knowledge or ID and then you put down the type of ID, okay? Satisfactory to you and no one else. Okay, uh, 45.17.8, I'll just paraphrase here. It says that just by the fact that you are notarizing this document, you're not certifying the contents of the document itself. That's, you know, feel free to read it. By the way, you see these references up there, 45.17. Anybody that wants to look at this, you're welcome to. I don't know how many people in the course of your job ever has to reference Georgia Code. Uh, we do. And just one thing, I got it figured out. I've, you know, there's a different way to look at it. But uh, if you Google um, Georgia Code, you'll see a link that says LexisNexis, or it may even take you right to this. It'll probably take you straight to the, to the disclaimer page. You check that. 
And then uh, it's a free search tool. Uh, notary law is Title 45, Chapter 17-1. Okay? And that's where all this comes from. It's no big mystery. And as you'll see, a lot of the things we talk about today, best practices are not there. Uh, 45, 17-8.1, I apologize. I, know this font, I think I need to split this up. But the font in the first paragraph talks about that the notary shall sign on the notarial certification by hand in ink, right? By hand, it's ink. Um, it doesn't specify color. Highly recommend that it's black or blue. A lot of people like to use blue because if, it's ever, if the signer ever needs to prove that this is the original and that's a copy, it helps in that manner. I always try to keep a blue pen, but black is not wrong, as are... I hate to say this, other colors are not wrong either. Just don't do them. They don't look good. It doesn't look professional. You know, when I said this morning, don't use red anywhere because we have been taught, in brain, and it's been in, ingrained in us, when you see red in a document, it's like, stop. Something's wrong with it, okay? Uh, preferably blue. Same for the, the seal color. Law does not specify color of a seal if you're going to use the rubber ink stamp. Black, uh, black is preferable. Blue is okay. Had a woman last week tell me that her um, seal maker, and this was one of the big box places, tried to get her by orange or, uh, I think it was orange or maroon, or something like that. You know, don't try to express your personality through your, hey, express your personality through your clothes, the way you make food, you know, the music you listen to, but don't do it through your notary seal. Um, okay. Okay, uh, 45, this, this section talks about advertising. Now, most of you are notaries in the capacity of your jobs, but if you are offering a service um, as part of, uh, say you own your own business or whatever, you're required to have some type of signage or notification that says, I'm not an attorney licensed to practice law in the state. Of course, if you are an attorney, you don't have to do this. Um, and I may not give legal advice except uh, fees for legal advice. That's in there because when we started to have a huge um, uh, influx, uh, especially of uh, citizens or, or folks from Latin America, um, and it started in the metro areas and spread out, that uh, people were, were uh, seeing a business, op business opportunity, and this is how. In Latin American countries, um, the office of notary public is held in much higher esteem. It's called notario publico. And so when people from those countries see those words, that indicates to them that those people are allowed to give legal advice. They're highly trained and can give immigration advice, da, 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 da. Well, as you might figure out, then people here saw a business opportunity, started advertising themselves as such. So that is what the legislature uh, put in. And while I'm on it, uh, I don't know how many people have ever uh, lived outside the U.S. or had a reason to get something notarized in a different country. It's not just Latin America. Most every other country in the world, what you do as a notary is held in much higher esteem. A higher esteem. And now, the, the, the qualifications are pretty strict in some areas. But anyway, so that's why that's in there. Okay, I apologize this. That's not House Bill. That's House Bill 381. Uh, this is the, the bill that got introduced this past session that never got voted on, that we are told will be reintroduced this coming session. Don't know how many people keep an eye on the Georgia General Assembly when they're in session. I really think you should. Um, not necessarily for noted reasons, but um, they usually convene about mid-January. They run for 40 days, not necessarily consecutively, and then they adjourn. This, you know, this year, I think they adjourn like the first week of April. So... House Bill 381, you can see it if you go to the Georgia General Assembly site, and it, it, it talks about, it talks about, it's, there's a draft there. Again, who knows? I mean, we're told it'll, it's going to come back up, but they get busy, who knows, whatever. Um, so in that bill, it, if it were to pass in its current draft format, it would require, of course, a, it would require someone to pass as an exam. More than likely, those would be given in an online-type format. 
especially uh, you know, because it would be almost impossible logistically to have classes all over the state like like this. Um, now the rules haven't been written for that. I can't tell you what it would look like, and that would you know we got to work on. We're going actually we'll start working on that, thinking that this may come to pass. Um, it would it better defines the seal requirements. For instance, it does specifically talk about it can be round, it can be rectangular, it must be two inches by two and a half rectangular, and it does say blue or black ink and things like that. And we happily stole that from the state of California because a lot of things get stolen in California. I told the lady that does similar work in California as I myself. I said we're going to steal this. She goes, that's fine. Everybody else has. So um, it would uh, it maintain a journal. It would require to maintain a journal. Now uh, there are a handful of states where this is required. Uh, the feedback I've gotten from states where it has been introduced and defeated was uh, some in the legal community opposed it. They felt it was overbearing or something. So, yeah, who knows? Um, it would require the certificates. Uh, it would uh, also require, as I said before, it would require a criminal background check to be done. It would also, the way it's currently written, and this was uh, a provision that was uh, put in by the chief sponsor. It would require you to have and submit your fingerprints as an applicant. So we'll see. Uh, if that happens, we certainly will have things on our website about it. Uh, the clerk's offices will, will uh, have something about it. And then my hope is like this past year when it was uh, introduced, there'll be enough lead time before the effective date you'll get enough time to figure that out. And of course, you'd be, if you just, for instance, if you, if you were just commissioned today, your commission's still good um, until four years from today. You wouldn't have to then take an exam until that point. It wouldn't reset everybody. That would be a nightmare. Um, so anyway. And then there, there's the actual link, which, uh, have fun writing that down. Uh, which you have to know, the, the, the PowerPoint, that's an active link in my, you know. Yeah, I know. I, uh, and Rachel corrected me. That was the pre <laughs> that was the previous year when they when they changed the number. Uh, yes, it's three eighty one. I apologize for that. Yep. If you just go to that legis.ga.gov, that's yeah. the General Assembly website, yeah. and you can just actually just search strictly House Bill three eighty one, yeah. so you don't have to have that long. No, thing. no, no. I yeah. Um, and I will. I'm going to share this PowerPoint with Richard's office, and I don't know. I uh, said so this morning. I don't know if they'd rather you email them for coffee or you, no. <laughs> She's like, no, 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 no. Uh, they're going to put it on their, on their website, which is GwinnettCourts.com, Gwinnett which is on that, you get that handout about the takeaways, it's down at the bottom there too. Um, okay, now we do have a current online course that's free. It's very general. Um, you can go to our website. It's uh, training.gsccca.org slash LMS. Um, and you can take it to your heart's content. Um, there is also an exam, not required, that you can take. There's a cost for that. It's ten dollars. Uh, we, I don't, again, I was talking earlier about the guy charging in his mailboxes, etc. Um, that was kind of the thought process on the on the ten dollars. We said, well, we ought to add some value to it, and um, that's what we did. So, it's a training. Dot. G-S-C-C-C-A, the three C's, that always messes people up, uh, .org slash L-M-S, it stands for Learning Management System. And you just register, it doesn't cost anything to register. Yep. If you have any questions about that, you can call Rachel. No, you can call it, you can call either one of us. That's it. true, it you, really you is. You can call either one of us, it doesn't matter. And honestly, uh, you know, we don't, I don't have you by answers my phone, she doesn't either, I mean, that, that phone number, this, the end of this thing is, direct to my desk, and so when I'm out doing stuff like this, I get a ding of an email that says I have a voicemail, so, you know, I do that after class, so uh, we're small. Okay, our website, now some of you, how many people uh, have seen our website, maybe search real estate records or something? Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, and that's, that's the way a lot of people know us, because Georgia is the only state in the country, because of the cooperation between the clerks of Superior Court and our office, that has a statewide real estate database online. That may not sound like a big deal to you, but it's a huge deal. And there's a reason we're the only, country in this, only state in the country that has that. When you think about 
the millions of documents filed every year in the 159 counties, developing a system to have those sent to the central database for verified, da 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 da. That's where most people know us from, okay? We have a notary and apostille section, bottom right. You can see that right there. And then you click that, and uh, you see three gray boxes. The one in the middle, you'll see, is the online application. So when you go there, it's going to be very simple, follow the instructions. There is a drop-down box where you'll select Gwinnett, obviously, if you're a you know, resident of Gwinnett. And then you fill in the information. It will print a nice, pretty three-page uh, packet. With an, uh, included in that is an instruction sheet that tells you where to go, the cost, and that kind of thing. And so then uh, you take the application. Of course, you have to get two endorsers from your home county, the resident county, to basically vouch for you. You have to have known them for a whole month. <laughs> hey, I don't make the laws up. That's what it says. Um, uh, the question I've never had answered is, well, never mind. Yeah, I'm going to. Uh, yeah, what, what, what could you know about me in a month? I don't know. I guess people have gotten married in a shorter time, but um, anyway. So, but anyway, you have to have that done, and you'll bring it down here. You sign that in front of whoever's designated to accept those and take the oath, and they're going to verify the information with you first. Um, so if, in fact, uh, you put your name in the application as this, but you, you, you decide when you get here, now nah, I do want to use my middle initial, you can do that. And so this process really has saved time because the old days you had to either come by, call, have mail me an application, da 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 da. So it's it's it's, it's greatly improved. Okay, so before we go today, let's talk a couple of things about. Well, you know what? It's three twenty-seven. Um, questions. Okay, let Rachel handle handle the uh, handle hand you. Yeah, that thing. So as a notary public, do I? I cannot sign a birth certificate for an international, a copy certify, of the... You couldn't certify... A certified copy. Right, right, right. I can. No, you can't certify a copy. What you could do, some people will do this, they'll make a copy of whatever, and then say, this is a true and exact copy of... I've had people ask me to do passports. Um, I have people... And, and even things that... You think, well, it's not a document, you know, like uh, I've had somebody ask me to notarize a photograph. How do you do that? Well, I had, you know, we made a copy, and then we said, this is a true and exact copy of Harry described the photograph and did that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Two questions. Uh huh? <laughs> In the middle of that screen, uh, name and change of address. Yeah, yeah. Is that to the clerk in your rearview mirror or the place you're going to, if you uh, move? Your rearview mirror. Your, your, <laughs> your rear view mirror. So when you're commissioned, um, you will remain commissioned in that county for four years, even if you move. And then at the end of that four years, if you wish to remain a notary, then you would apply wherever you're living then. Okay. Yeah, good question. I didn't get that part. Yeah. And within 30 days of the, of the change of address, you're going to send a notice to where you're commissioned, the clerk's office, and a copy to us. Um, same with the name change. Now, the name change is a little different because you're going to need a new seal, right? So, within 30 days, then you'll have to come in and get an amended commission certificate because that's what you're going to take to the seal maker for the new seal. Now, once you have noted that, don't notarize anything until you get the new seal because that way, if after that date, if a document shows up with your signature and seal, that's going to raise a red flag because maybe that wasn't you because you've already said, I, I, I'm not this, I'm changing my name. Okay. Just, yeah. just a, uh, a couple more examples of photo IDs that you, they're normally common, valid. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, certainly a, 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 some type of uh, defense department um, veterans ID. Uh, you know, uh, any, I don't know if any county employees are in here. County employees have picture IDs. Hospitals, um, any type of learning institution have them now. Private business, I mean, and, and think about it. This all goes back 
Now, I'm not saying this didn't occur before this date, but primarily it really became more prevalent after 9-11, right? And so you look at the security in this courthouse. Now, I'm guessing they did have security before September 11th, 2001, but it probably wasn't as beefy as what they have now. So, yeah, anything, I mean, government issues recommended because, you, you know, it's been vetted, but it could be, it, it could be a non-government ID um, that you're comfortable with. And the law doesn't even speak to the fact it has to be current. Um, in the draft of this bill, it does specify it must be a current ID, but there are those that have the thought that, you know, that you might be uh, affecting especially elderly people who have since stopped driving and didn't bother to go get the non-driver ID and they have a, a driver's license expired three years ago. But anyway, yeah. yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, it's, it's two quick questions. Notarial uh, act, is that each time you have to do the stamp and the signature? Yep. So if they have if five have different a, documents. Right, if you have a document with, with uh, multiple signers, and they're all there with you, um, or at any one time they're there, yeah, it'd be for each one of those, exactly. It's not pages, number of pages or anything, yeah. And um, also, too, I noticed on your presentation, um, I worry about identity theft. Um, as an example, you documented the driver license number, mm -hmm. and with their address and things like that, adding a driver license, which is unique to each person, mm -hmm. Um, do you recommend that? Because you can lose your journal, and I think it goes to the liability you were talking about. Um, Just with... always know where your journal is. <laughs> right, well, I, know what I, you're saying because I guess with I, well, the I, holding I on to the documents. If, in fact, the journal is made, if it's required, that's going to be a public record. I can promise you that. So, um, now thank goodness, I don't know how many people remember, younger people don't remember this, in Georgia, our driver's license number used to be our social security number. Of course, I remember when I, my first checkbook, I was just trying to save time. I went ahead and put my social security number on the check underneath my address because we didn't think about it. We didn't have the internet, and that's, you know, it's available. So you bring up a good point. Bring a good point about that, yeah. On the document that is being notarized, there's a place for you to hand entry the date that your notary is good through. Mm -hmm. If that date is also on your stamp, is mm -hmm. it required that you fill that in or just best practice? I, you know, if I see it, I do it. You know, and, and actually the commission, uh, putting your commission um, expiration date on the document, it, it doesn't need to be part of the seal. It can be, I'm actually, I've handwritten it in, you know, but if you already see a pre, uh, a pre-printed uh, uh, space uh, uh, on the document. I mean, it's on there. You've got it in your seal or you've got it on something else. And is it required that you even use a seal if you hand entry all that? It, it, is, in, it is in Georgia. Your, your, your seal must have uh, uh, four elements. Okay. Uh, name is commission, state of Georgia, notary public, and the county where you're commissioned uh, towards the bottom, bottom there. Okay, one last. Uh, there is something out there in uh, several areas called a signature guarantee and a medallion guarantee. Mm -hmm. I know that home that has nothing to do with notary, but those things are getting hard to find. Mm -hmm. And any any uh, revelation going on on those things as far as other than going having to go to a bank official or whatever? I, yeah, what you just said. I don't know of anything in the notary world that there's any you know, talk about that at all. Yeah, I know I've heard the terms. You probably know more about it. I'm sure you know more about it than I do. But I, I don't know of anything in the notary area that would be associated with that. Two questions. First of all, um, somebody comes in and their ID shows that their name is James Robert so-and-so, mm -hmm. and they sign it Jim Bob so-and-so. And you say, is this your legal signature? And they say, yes. Mm -hmm. what, what are you supposed to do in that kind of situation? I mean, are, their ID I, does not match their signature. I mean, I, I ask them if they can, to, to, if they give me a driver's license. If you, you know, um, they don't have to. But I've asked them if they'll sign how their name is listed on their driver's license because that'll, that'll eliminate that question. Um, you don't get into that. And look, I know logically... <laughs> and that you've got the picture, 
it is the same person, but I know what you're saying. It, if you can ask them to do that beforehand, you might be able to, to head that off, but, you know. Second question, they walk in and they say, oh, I signed this already, but it's my signature. Uh, I, I would have them sign it again, you know. I would have them sign it again. Okay. There were a couple of words in the duties of the notary that I didn't quite understand. I apologize for That's being okay. obtuse. You, you can, I, I've got a, you can come up afterwards. I got my card. You can email me. Okay. Um, and, and we can exchange that. Uh, Thank you. Yes, yes ma'am. Just real quick, if you are old school and you have an embosser, do we need to change them for the ink ones now? No, it's, it's either or. Just don't, don't use both at the same time. But yeah, law, the law allows either one. Um, could you explain just a little bit further about um, the fact that we don't have to explain the document per se as we, right. you know, but at the same time, we could get into trouble, be sued or whatever. Can you kind of elaborate just a little bit more on that? You could get into trouble doing what? Um, as far as being sued for... Uh, I don't, I mean, honestly, oh. I don't... It's, oh. uh, I don't know. If, just uh, reading the document. Any notary may be held personally uh, yeah. liable for any financial loss. Well, I think the obvious thing the would be. Failure. Yeah, if I don't understand and, and really understand the document, I'm just verifying signatures, yeah, yeah. But yet I could get into trouble. Well, I mean, for instance, you, did, you didn't ask for ID. You didn't verify their, 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 you didn't verify, you know, that they are who they say they are, and you went ahead and did it. Yeah, that, that's the biggie right there. That's what that's talking about. Is it uh, possible to notarize a relative signature if you have no vested interest in the document? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, Georgia law doesn't forbid that. I was just saying it's, it's not a, a best practice to do so, but, you know. Hi, two quick questions. Um, the legislature that's under consideration or will uh -huh. be under consideration, current notaries, will we be grandfathered in or yes, yes, upon renewal, will we have upon, to go through Upon all that? renewal, you okay. would have to, I, well, let me say, I, that's a way that the thought process is now. So upon renewal, you would, you would have to do whatever it ends up being, whether it's a, a course and exam or just a, I don't know, but yeah. And somebody may have already asked us, and I'm sorry if they have, but when they, when someone hands us something to notarize, uh -huh. like the document, right. do we need to read the document or are we, we just, we're just verifying that's their name. We don't care what it is, just as long as we do our no, duty. No, I mean, it, you know, uh, the, the question came up about, um, this uh, come out before, it's obvious that this document originated in, you know, Florida. And the signer may be even from out of the country. Signer may be from Germany. I don't care. If, the, if that person from Germany has ID that I can verify their identity, and that person is in front of me, and that document is with that person at that time, then I, you know, I don't care where it came from, and I don't really care where it's going after that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Yes, ma'am. Okay. For notaries who have already completed the exam, uh -huh. is there a list of those? Where can we find uh, you know, online? Is there a list for the, the uh, notaries nah, already? We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't track that because it's voluntary. Okay. Um, now, obviously, if it became mandatory, there would be some requirement on our part to track who has passed it and who has not. But right now, I wouldn't be able to provide that to you. So after today, if we choose to proceed, mm -hmm. the next step is to fill out the application. Go online, uh-huh. And there's back, instructions. Okay. And then you get your two endorsers. They have to be residents of your county with you. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you have that, and put that, then you bring it down to the clerk superior court's office. Okay. And then you know they'll review it. They'll either approve it, whatever. And then uh, you pay the fee. Okay. Which is ten dollars. No, it's no. thirty. $37, 99 percent of the counties it's $37, and, um, and then they will uh, have you sign the application, 
then they will give you uh, two copies of your commission certificate. One is for you to keep and one is to give to whoever's going to make your seal. And then you get your seal in the mail or whatever. You go to mailboxes. I'm not sure what the wait period is for those seals. But, um, and then you're, you're ready to go. Do you know what the cost of the seal I is? I really don't know. Does anybody know? So she's, she's saying she had hers at Staples, and they had some anywhere from like 12 up to 40. So it's whatever, you know. The embossers are a little bit more expensive. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you said a seal is required. Yes, ma'am. Uh, from the notary. I am in a position where I audit documents, uh -huh. and an affidavit can be filed, signed by a notary, uh, in lieu of this document. Okay. I have seen just the little stamp that says my commission expires, hmm. and I'm told that's a seal. No, but I not. That's your commission it. date. Right. Yeah, it doesn't have those elements right up there. Right. Yep. And what do seals look like? I noticed yours was in a rectangle, inside a rectangle. Yeah. Is the seal generally round? Uh, the embossers are round. I know that. Uh, but I've seen the ink ones round, too. It, again, right. law doesn't specify that. Uh, but I'm sorry? Yeah, tr so, yeah, and I don't, I mean, it's a personal preference, I guess, at this point. Um, and like I said, if this, this bill if this bill passes, it did contemplate both, so it would allow to have either one, rectangular or um, round. I'd look for that. With, I think, actually, in, in, the, in, the, in the bill draft, it also talks about an actual border, I believe. It says about a border. It has to, you know, to make it in, you know, enclosed in something. And then if I receive out-of-state documentation uh, notarized by someone out-of-state, do mm -hmm. you think I should request something notarized by Georgia? No, I wouldn't get into that because uh, there is a part of the law where, although we found out this morning Missouri didn't follow that, um, that uh, on its face um, that those are effective across um, state lines. So... Now, if you certainly had a question about a notary in another state, you could contact that state notary administrator. But in general, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't get to reject those just because it's not a Georgia notary. Then you're going to be making more work for yourself. I'm impressed. Y'all hung out late on a Friday afternoon. Although you really did ensure you don't have to go back to the office. So I know there was a little bit of that in there, too. Um, I really appreciate your time. If you have any questions, uh, our, our information is uh, here. And uh, we're going to, uh, I said, we're going to send this PowerPoint um, to, to uh, Richard's office. They'll post it on that website, that GwinnettCourts.com. And you're free to, you know, access it. Like I said, just don't go out and teach your own class and, you know, although you Probably better than I am, but that's okay. Fine with it. So, anyway, thank you very much.